open your Bibles to Esther chapter 7. Esther chapter 7. If you are a guest with us uh, this morning, uh, I just want you to know from the outset that at First Baptist Church, we believe that the Bible is the inspired Word of God. This is God's revelation to us. It's to be the very foundation for our lives. We believe in the value of God's word so much that we don't think that what I have to say today matters very much at all unless it agrees with what God has said. And so that's why we encourage you to open your Bibles, find it on the app on your phone. We want you to see what God has to say for yourself. And we're going to do that from Esther 7 and 8. I'm excited to jump back into the book of Esther today. And if you haven't been with us, let me catch you up relatively quickly. In 586 B.C., the Jews in Judea were conquered by the Babylonians and they entered into exile. A few decades later, Babylon was conquered by Persia and King Cyrus allowed the Jews to begin to return to their homeland and to rebuild. And so the book of Ezra documents uh, the, the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. The book of Nehemiah documents the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. But the book of Esther is about the Jews who stayed back in Persia. The, the setting for this book is over 100 years after the Jews had entered captivity. So life in a foreign land was the only life that they had known. And, and the book of Esther might be most well known for what it does not contain because God's name is never mentioned in this book you can read it all day today and study it as much as you want, and you will not find his name anywhere here. And I'm thankful for books of the Bible where the activity of God is obvious and his power is on full display. And I'm thankful for the book of Esther where God's activity is veiled because I think that's pretty relatable. I think that's how we feel often about God's activity in our lives. We struggle with the invisibility of God especially when things are going wrong. We, we struggle to understand what he's up to. We, we want to hear his voice. We want his plan to be more obvious. And, and the great thing about the way this book is written is that by not mentioning God, it encourages us as readers to look for him. And as we do, we discover he is everywhere in here. He, he is working even in the tiniest details, just as he is working in the details of our lives. And so our purpose for this series is that we would trust and that we would see the hidden hand of God. That we would trust and see the hidden hand of God. And as I think about moms today, uh, I, I know that God's hand, I think it has been difficult to see, especially in this last year. And I'm just praying that this will be an encouragement to you, and you will be able to see God working, even if it isn't always obvious. And so, so far in this book, we have watched as God's hidden hand has caused Esther, who was an orphan in this foreign land, and she ends up being elevated all the way to queen of Persia. We've also watched as this villain, Haman, Boo! Second in command was able to persuade the king to make a royal decree that will allow all the Jews to be killed. And this prompts Esther's father figure, Mordecai, to urge her to go before the king to reveal her ethnicity and to save her people. And Mordecai doesn't believe that it's a coincidence that Esther is in this elevated position at this moment. He says to her, who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And despite Esther's trepidation, she asks for all of the Jews to fast on her behalf. And she commits to going before the king, saying, if I die, I die. That brings us to chapter 5. And the king extends his golden scepter and asks Esther what her request is. And she asks for the king and for wicked Haman to come to a feast with her that night. And then at the feast, she asks them to come to another feast the next night. But the problem as we entered chapter 6 was that while she was planning on asking the king to save her people the next night, Haman was planning to ask the king to kill Mordecai first thing in the morning. 
And that sets up chapter 6, which is, in my opinion, the funniest chapter in the Bible. The, the king experiences the sovereign insomnia. And he has one of his guys read the chronicles of his kingdom to him to try to fall back asleep. And he's reminded that there is this Jew named Mordecai that had saved his life, but nothing had been done to thank him or to honor him. And, and so right at that moment, Haman enters the palace to ask the king if he can kill Mordecai, the one that the king had just been reminded saved his life. But before Haman could ask to kill Mordecai, the king asked Haman how he should honor someone. And Haman was pretty sure that the king wanted to honor him because who else would the king want to honor but me? So Haman describes his greatest fantasy of, of public praise and recognition while being paraded around the city in the king's clothing. And the king says, that's an awesome idea, Haman. I want you to do all of that for Mordecai. <laughs> so Haman is forced to honor the man who refused to honor him. And, and Mordecai, meanwhile, we thought about this from his perspective a couple weeks ago. Mordecai probably thought this whole event was ridiculous. This was Haman's fantasy, not his, right? This is not what Mordecai wanted. He, he probably felt like this was not really helping the Jews' overall situation. And he had no idea what God had just saved him from. And, and we often think we know what we need from God we like to tell him what he needs to do and, and when he needs to do it. And, and I hope we are seeing in this book that God's plan of salvation and deliverance and retribution and justice is better than our own. It's better than ours. And as we come to chapter 7, the salvation for the Jews in Persia is still hanging in the balance Haman's just told his family what had happened that day and how he had to parade Mordecai around the city. And they are warning him, look, if Mordecai is a Jew, then, then you're going to be in trouble. And that's going to turn out to be prophetic. And there's someone greater at work behind the scenes here. And then Haman is rushed off to the second feast with the king and Queen Esther. And that's where we pick up the story in chapter 7. And once again, we're going to let this great narrative speak for itself. Esther chapter 7, starting in verse 1. So the king and Haman went into the feast with Queen Esther. And on the second day, as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king again said to Esther, What is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. This is the third time he's offered Esther up to half of his kingdom. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish, and my people for my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed to be killed and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent. For our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. So as we see Esther's salvation plea here, the, the queen is having to walk sort of a thin line because she needed to accuse Haman without implicating the king even though a royal decree with the king's ring was the reason for the crisis. And so she's trying to walk that line where she is able to accuse Haman without implicating the king, and she sets this up without revealing that it is the Jewish people who are in danger. The king still doesn't know that Esther is Jewish, which is kind of crazy, and he still doesn't seem to know that his royal decree has amounted to a Jewish death sentence. It's really bizarre. He's just presented as this king that's totally out of touch with, with life in his kingdom. And so Esther starts to talk about my people. Right? We have been sold. And you might remember that Haman offered the king 10,000 talents of silver which is a crazy amount of money, by the way. You can go online and there's different thoughts about exactly how much this is. But I, I think it's about 200,000 years worth of labor is what 10,000 talents of silver amounts to. We are going to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. And at the end of verse 4, she, she frames this as 
Haman actually hurting the king. Probably, probably embellishing a little with our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. What Esther is saying there is that this decree is going to cause a major economic problem for the king. All the money that was offered you does not cover the losses you will experience when my people are annihilated. So if you had just made us slaves in your kingdom, I wouldn't have said anything. But killing over a million people that are part of your empire is not going to be good for anyone. So Esther has, in my opinion, just set this up perfectly. The king has no idea who's responsible for this, but he is firmly on her side. The stage is set for verse 5. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, Who is he? And where is he who has dared to do this? The king doesn't know who this was, but he is hot. And I am pretty confident that Haman is putting the pieces together in his head. And his seat is starting to get really uncomfortable in this moment. And it's about to get worse as Esther decisively exposes him as the true villain. And Esther said... A foe and enemy, this wicked Haman. There had to be a finger point involved there, right? The text doesn't tell us, but there just had to be. If you go to Sight and Sound and watch them recreate this, there has to be a finger point. This wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. Haman's day is going very differently than he had planned. Right? If you remember, when he woke up in the morning, he thought he was going to go and get permission to kill Mordecai on this huge gallows that he had made for him. And then he was going to go and enjoy an evening of royalty with the king and the queen and feast and be happy. That's what today was supposed to be for Haman. The tables have turned And it is about to get worse. And the king arose in his wrath from the wine drinking and went into the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that harm was determined against him by the king. The king has to go collect himself in the garden. His head must have been spinning, right? He had given Haman so much power He had given him his signet ring. He had been convinced to essentially eliminate a whole people group from his kingdom. He had been made to look like a fool. And he kind of was, at least the way the text presents him. And on top of that, King just found out that his wife was Jewish. (laughs) And he had made a decree to kill the Jews, which is not a recipe for marital bliss, by the way, right? If your wife is Jewish, you probably shouldn't make this type of decree. He's like, wow, this is not good. Not a good day for him. He had just honored Mordecai, who was a Jew, that day. He, he might have been thinking about all the other Jews who were a valuable part of his empire. He probably should have been committing to not making irreversible decisions while drunk ever again. That's what he should have been doing. But meanwhile, back inside, Haman thinks his only chance to remain alive is to plead for his, wife, for his life from the queen. And the irony is pretty strong once again. Haman goes from demanding that Mordecai kneel before him to being on his knees himself before Esther, pleading for his life. And I just need to point out once again how God seems to enjoy mocking the systems of power that man creates. The the word of God mocks the empires that men build. Just think big picture for a second. You have Haman an Agagite, a a historic enemy of the Jews. He rises to second in command in all of Persia, and he's able to use that position of power to deceive or persuade the king to making a decree that all of the Jews are going to be killed. Oh no! What's God going to do? Is there panic in heaven trying to figure out a plan B? No. God uses an orphan, exiled Jewish young lady He elevates her to queen of all the land. He gives her favor in the eyes of the king. 
God, God doesn't even need for his name to be mentioned in the story to accomplish his plan. This is his work behind the scenes to where now this supposedly powerful, proud man is pleading for his life. Where? At the feet of a formerly orphaned female foreigner turned queen. Because that's what our God can do. Nowhere in this text do we even see, do we even have something that is by definition a miracle. God doesn't intervene here by going against the laws of nature at all. This is very different from a book like Exodus. Instead, what we have is a sovereign sequence of events that could never happen by chance, but can only be explained by the sometimes hidden providence of God. And, and I know there are times in my own life where I come to God and I say, God, I need a miracle. Do you ever say, God, I need a miracle right now. And, and as I think about this text, maybe what I should be saying is, God, I need you. I need you. Whether you provide a miracle or you just are sovereignly working in the sequence of events, I need you. Whether you're going to take center stage or whether you're going to work behind the scenes, I need you to be sovereign. I need you to be God right now. And, and God doesn't use a specific miracle in Esther, but he is faithful to save his people. Look at verse 8. And the king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were w drinking wine as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was, pleading for his life. And the king said, will he even assault the queen in my presence, in my house? As the word left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king, said, moreover, the gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai whose word saved the king, is standing at Haman's house 50 cubits high. And the king said, hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of the king was abated. Just a guess, I don't think anyone liked Haman. Right? Just based on this text, that eunuch was really quick to jump in and remind the king about the gallows that Haman had built for Mordecai and to remind him, he built these gallows for the man that saved your life, king. Remember that? That's who he was trying to kill. He built the gallows 50 cubits high for the man that saved you, king. Obviously, the cost of lumber in Persia was cheaper than it is now. Right? If that happened today, gallows would be much shorter. But then, 50 cubits high. The final straw for the king was thinking that Haman was assaulting the queen when he was actually just begging for his life to be spared. So ironically, again, Haman's end comes via false accusation when he was the one falsely accusing the Jews. And a day that started with Haman coming to ask the king for permission to hang Mordecai ends with Haman hanging on his own gallows. Because God's plan of salvation and retribution and justice and deliverance is better than our own. So now Haman's dead, but there's still the problem of this decree against the Jewish people and that is what chapter 8 seeks to rectify. We'll move through this pretty quickly. On that day, King Ahasuerus gave to Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was to her. So he finds out that Esther's Jewish, and this guy that saved his life, oh yeah, she ra he raised me, he raised me. He, Esther had told what he was to her, and the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman, and that was probably awkward, right? Especially for Haman's wife, this was very different than what she was expecting. And, and we are almost going to get the sense that the king thought that this was enough. Haman's gone. Mordecai has essentially taken his place. But Esther and Mordecai weren't just looking out for their own interests. 
They were looking out for the interests of their people. And so Esther has to go to the king again. Then Esther spoke again to the king. She fell at his feet and wept and pleaded with him to avert the evil plan of Haman the Agagite and the plot that he had devised against the Jews. When the king held out the golden scepter. So she had to go unannounced again. And he once again holds out the golden scepter to her. Esther rose and stood before the king. And she said, if it please the king. And if I have found favor in his sight. And if the thing seems right before the king. And I am pleasing in his eyes. Let an order be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, which he wrote to destroy all the Jews who are in the, all the provinces of the king. For how can I bear to see the calamity that is coming to my people? Or how can I bear to see the destruction of my kindred? Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and they have hanged him on the gallows because he intended to lay hands on the Jews. Like, what more do you want from me, right? I already did all this, but you may write as you please with regard to the Jews in the name of the king and seal it with the king's ring. For an edict in the name of the king and sealed with the king's ring cannot be revoked. This is the problem with a bad, irrevocable decree, you can't take it back. But you can write a better irrevocable decree to essentially cancel out the first one, and that is the plan that they come up with. We'll write a better one that cancels out the first. That's what King Ahasuerus gives Mordecai the power to do. We see it here in verse 9. The king's scribes were summoned at that time in the third month, which is the month of Sivan on the 23rd day. So we are two months after the original decree was made against the Jews and still nine months before that day was to be carried out. And an edict was written according to all that Mordecai commanded concerning the Jews to the satraps and the governors and the officials of the provinces from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces, to each province in its own script and to each people in its own language and also to the Jews in their script and their language. And he wrote in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed it with the king's signet ring. Then he sent the letters by mounted carriers riding on swift horses that were used in the king's service, bred from the royal stud. This is the Pony Express on steroids. Right, just the Persian version of that, saying that the king allowed the Jews who were in every, every city to gather and to defend their lives, to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate, we've heard that wording before, any armed force of any people or province that might attack them, women and children included, and to plunder their goods. On one day, throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, a copy of what was written was to be issued as a decree in every province being publicly displayed to all peoples and the Jews were to be ready on that day to take vengeance on their enemies. So the couriers mounted on their swift horses that, they were, used, that were used in the service of the king rode out hurriedly, urged by the king's command and the decree was issued in Susa, the citadel. So essentially what this order does, this better decree does, was it encourages the Jews to defend themselves against any attackers. And you might ask, how in the world does that help the situation at all? Because if you knew someone was planning to wipe you out 12 months in advance, you would probably prepare to defend yourself whether the king gave you permission or not, right? You don't really need the king's permission to try to defend, your, to defend yourself against an attack. But the major change here was less about the decree itself and more about what the decree did for public perception. Because the message of the first decree was the king wants to kill all the Jews in his kingdom. But now, with the second decree, the message is essentially the opposite. The king wants the Jews to defend themselves and to conquer their enemies. And, and I think we all know how hard it is for politicians to publicly admit their mistakes. And so I think we should give the king a little bit of credit here because this 
This is a big, gigantic, my bad, right? That's what the second decree is. Two months after making the first decree, just kidding. That's not what I meant at all. My wife's Jewish. I love her. And, and we see the kingdom's response to this 180 in the final paragraph of chapter 8. Then Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal robes of blue and white with a great golden crown and a robe of fine linen and purple. And the city of Susa shouted and rejoiced. And can I just point out, it, it turns out that chapter 6, Mordecai being paraded around the city in the king's clothes wasn't just a gigantic, uh, elaborate game of dress up. It was a preview of what God was going to do. And, and the dramatic reversal should not be missed. Two months ago, Mordecai had a death sentence. And now he is dressed in royalty and issuing decrees in the name of the king using the same ring that was used to decree for the Jews to be annihilated. And the whole city of Susha rejoiced the king, the Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. And in every province and in every city, wherever the king's command and his edict reached, there was gladness and joy among the Jews, a feast and a holiday. This is my favorite part. And many from the peoples of the country declared themselves Jews for fear of the Jews had fallen on them. We're Jewish. We're Jewish. And remember, this is not in Jerusalem or Judea. These are Persians who now want to identify as Jews because even without God speaking, even without a miraculous intervention, his hidden hand was moving and it was undeniable and it wasn't something that anyone wanted to oppose. Fear had fallen on them. And as for the Jews in Persia, Earlier in the week, they were all fasting and mourning, and now they are feasting and they are rejoicing because we have a God whose plan of salvation and deliverance and justice is better than our own. We have a God who is faithful to his people. And the book of Esther is a story about physical deliverance. Pa Pastor John and I were actually talking about this week about how if you try to directly relate the, the physical deliverance the Jews experienced with the spiritual deliverance that we all need to experience, the illustration actually breaks down in a hurry. Because for the Jews in Persia, they needed the freedom and support to accomplish their deliverance for themselves, right? They just needed the king's support to say, fight for yourself. Right? I'm rooting for you. Go get them. And I think a lot of people wish that's how our spiritual deliverance was accomplished as well. Right? We almost wish it was, I can do this. I can work for this. I can defeat this. I just need a little support, and then I'll take it from there. But the truth of Scripture, spiritually speaking, is that we don't just need the freedom to defend ourselves from the enemy of sin we needed someone to fight the battle for us. We need someone to fight in our place. We are totally helpless on our own, which is why we needed Jesus to come on a rescue mission from heaven. We needed Jesus to live the perfect life that we failed to live. We needed Jesus to overcome the temptations that had defeated us. We needed Jesus to die the death that we deserve to die, to take the just punishment for all the sins we had committed against him on himself at the cross because there is no other way of salvation. We needed him to rise from the dead, to conquer sin and the grave. And because he has, because he has, for everyone who recognizes, I can't do this on my own. I can never be good enough. I will never defeat the enemy of sin myself. My good will never outweigh the bad in the eyes of a holy God. I need a savior. 
If you place your faith in the perfect life, sacrificial death, and victorious resurrection of Jesus, all of your sins are forgiven. The righteousness of Jesus is credited to your account. You become part of the eternal family of God, not because we deserve it, not because of anything that we have done, but because our salvation is through our deliverer, not our own defense. Our salvation is through our deliverer, not our own defense. And I am so thankful for a faithful God who is still working behind the scenes and in the tiny details of our lives. And I am thankful that he was willing to come to the center of the stage of history to fight the battle we could never win so we can sing about the victory of the cross today even if we're in the middle of the confusion and the messiness of this life. And so I'm going to pray for us, and then Amanda is going to come and sing about that victory that Jesus has won. Heavenly Father, we need you. We need you to be sovereign. We need you to be faithful. Even though we recognize that so often we are unfaithful to you. So I'm so thankful that even in times where we feel so defeated, and even times where we feel like we should be better by now, but we're not, we can lift our eyes and we can see Jesus who came to the center of the stage of history. And we can sing about the victory that was won at the cross. And so I pray that we would not try to do this on our own, but that we would depend more and more on you every day to win the battles that we could never win. So thank, thank you for being faithful and thank you for being victorious. We want to sing about that victory today in Jesus' name. Amen.